Hi, hello students. Welcome back to India's most comprehensive online learning platform, Baiju's Exam Prep. This is Anil Prasad Surampudi, and in this session, we are going to completely have a comprehensive idea about how to crack all the questions of CVA, right from the topic instruction set architecture till the pipelining concept. So, without wasting any more time, let me take you people straight away into the topic okay so let's get into the computer architecture and organization before i start the session i request you people to share and subscribe to this channel and share this session to as many people as possible to make most out of this session to crack the gate exam very easily and comprehensively so let me start this session now then so when it comes to the CYA. What are the first prerequisites? First of all, when it comes to the COA, you might have already prepared and at we are at the verge of the gate exam. Let us concentrate only on the topics that are expected to be coming in ISC Bangalore uh, 2024 gate exam. Okay, ISC Bangalore, um, you know, said the papo. I hope you already knew about it, right? So let me take you people into this. This is all about myself. This is Anil Prasad Surampudi. I do have a total of 13 plus years of experience and I'm a triple PG holder. I did my MS in information technology. I did my MBA. I also did my MSc in mathematics. And I taught everywhere in India and in major institutions, including Andaman and Nicobar and Srinagar. First, let us start with the instruction set architecture, that is CPU design. When it comes to the CPU design, what kind of a question that can be asked in the gate exam? First of all, let me tell you, if you talk about a CPU design, please confirm, is my audio completely audible and visible? Is my audio uh, audible? Am I completely audible and visible? Okay, then fine. Just a minute. Let me confirm. Yep, now. Uh, hi, hello. Please mark your presence. Hi, Drisha Ayyappan. Very good evening. Hi, Arun Kumar. Hi, Mason. Okay, fine. Let me start this. See, first of all, let me tell you how our perspective should be, in what way our perspective should be when it comes to cracking the COA uh, questions in the gate exam. Let us understand. The thing is, there are three main topics in COA. First of all, the first one is the CPU design. The next one is the memory. The third one is the pipelining. When it comes to the IISC Bangalore, when you observe the previous paper pattern, we just will look only at the CPU design, memory and the pipelining because most of the questions are only from these two topics, were well, only from these three topics. And I also will tell you which model question that you may expect in gate 2024. So just um, um, history, like looking at the history, we can come to a conclusion that the IAC Bangalore is more prone to asking such model questions. Okay, so let me start. When it comes to the CPU design, first of all, the more percentage of the questions going to finding out the number of bits in a specific instruction field. How we will be able to find out a number of bits in a specific instruction field? For this, we need to understand the instruction format of the system. Every, instru every instruction in every processor will be of several bits. Let me show you this. I love you. Stay focused. Let us understand how we are going to calculate the number of bits per instruction. Initially, I am going to show you a simple and sample question. Right from then, we are going to pick up the a few other questions to solve and finally, you will be able to understand how we will be able to solve every question on the instruction set architecture. First of all, let us understand, in the CPU design, the major terms that are going to be coined, the major terms that are going to be used, CPU size. Sir, what is CPU size? CPU size will be given in bits. It may be 16 bits or 32 bits or 64 bits. Okay. If the CPU size is 16 bits, 
वन वर्ड साइज इन द मेमरी इज सिक्सटीन बिट्स अदरवाइज इफ द सीपीयू साइज इज थर्टी टू बिट्स वन वर्ड साइज इन द मेमरी इज थर्टी टू बिट्स इफ द सीपीयू साइज इज सिक्सटी फोर बिट्स वन वर्ड साइज इन द मेमरी इज सिक्सटी फोर बिट्स जनरली मोस्ट कॉमनली इंस्ट्रक्शन साइज गोस विद द सीपीयू साइज बिकॉज instruction will be stored in one word of the main memory i mean there are some exceptions unless stated otherwise instruction size will be equal to the cpu word size or the cpu architecture size or cpu size if the cpu size is equal to 16 bits instruction size will also be equal to 16 bits 80% of the times but sometimes there will be two word instructions at that time one instruction size will be equal to 32 bits fine let us forget about everything at the simplest cpu at a simple cpu instruction size is equal to cpu size okay now let us take a 32 bit cpu that means my instruction size is equal to 32 bits okay let us for an example in a 32 bit cpu there are four fields in an instructions in an instruction there are four fields 1 2 3 4 what are these fields for an example every instruction will have an opcode field every instruction will have um maybe some register field a memory address field um an immediate operand field but sure every instruction in every system in every processor will definitely have an opcode field all the other fields will be dependent on system to system will vary from system to system for an example let us solve a simple question in a 32 bit cpu there are four fields the first one is opcode second one is a processor's register third one is a memory address fourth one is an immediate operand field for which we just need to find out one field bits generally um for an example the system has a total number of opcodes which is equal to let us say 32 my system has a total of 32 opcodes and 64 registers and one memory which is of um 32k okay so i have a 32 opcodes total of 32 opcodes and 64 registers and 32k word main memory now having these details collected we need to find out immediate operand field there may be a question like we are given number of opcodes the total number of registers and a main memory size okay now we need to find out what is the immediate operand size simple in the in terms of number of bits let me tell you how it's going to work see i have 32 opcodes if i do have 32 opcodes opcode field will take Five digits because two power five is equal to thirty-two bits. In order to represent any of the opcodes which are equal to eight out of thirty-two, I require five bits. Opcode field will take five digits, and number of registers is equal to sixty-four. I require six digits to represent any register in a total of sixty-four registers. And my main memory size is equal to thirty-two k, meaning one main memory address is equal to. 15 bits why because my total main memory size is equal to 2 power 15 2 power 15 is equal to 32k so 15 bits will be for memory address what is the total size of the instruction total size of the instruction is equal to 32 bits which is equal to cpu size now in a 32 bit cpu the instruction size is equal to 32 bits and we are provided with three fields one is opcode field one more is a register field one more is a memory address field and one more is which we need to find out the immediate operand field so 5 plus 6 is equal to 11 11 plus 15 is equal to 26 26 plus 6 is equal to 32 so immediate operand field will be equal to 6 digits this is how simply we will be able to solve the questions on the instruction set architecture so let us um you know solve all the question most of the questions i mean um as many number of questions as we can solve in this session from the instructions at architecture we will solve the first question goes a processor has 40 distinct instructions and 24 general purpose registers 
a 32 bit instruction word has an opcode to register operands and an immediate operand the number of bits available for the immediate operand field is what this is the question simple how we are going to solve this simple it is very similar to the way we solved the previous question the thing is processor has 40 distinct instructions and a 24 general purpose registers a 32 bit instruction here the size of the instruction is equal to 32 bit so the size of the instruction is equal to 32 bit how many fields would you have 40 I mean obviously every instruction would have an op, op code field and 24 general registers a 32 bit instruction word has an op code to register operands this is an op code followed by register 1 register 2 to register operands and an immediate operand there is one immediate operand we need to find out the number of digits available for the immediate operand field simple how many uh, digits we do require for the opcode field how many opcodes we do have 40 distinct instructions meaning there are 40 opcodes in the system system is supporting 40 opcodes so if it supports 40 opcodes what is the total number of bits for the opcode in order to represent 40 opcodes i require six digits because if i do have only five digits i can represent a maximum of 32 instructions 32 opcodes if i do have a total of six opcode digits i will be able to represent a maximum of 64 opcodes so in order to represent 40 opcodes i require six digits here okay r1 and r2 number of digits for a register field depends on the number of registers in the system the number of registers is equal to according to the question 24 in order to represent 24 registers i require 5 bits because 2 power 5 is equal to 32 i will be able to represent a maximum of 34 registers if i have a 5 digit register field if i do have only a 4 bit register field then i will be able to represent a maximum of only 16 registers so 5 digits here 5 digits here so op code is equal to 6 5 digits is for register 1 5 digits is for register 2 and remaining 16 plus 16 is equal to 32 so the immediate operand field will take 16 digits so do we have any doubt so far please uh, mark your presence and uh, let's make this as interactive as possible if you do have any doubt i want you people to fire it up immediately the moment i i you know explain this question okay can we go to the next question can we go to the next question risha or arun or uh, Majin? anyhow let us go to the next question next question is as follows consider a processor with 64 registers and an instruction set of size 12 okay first consider a processor with 64 registers let us write away segregated detail let us write away collect the details processor with 64 registers number of registers is equal to what 64 meaning how many bits i do require to represent the register field 2 power 6 is equal to 64 so one register field will be equal to 6 digit then instruction set of size 12 so my instruction set of the processor i would say i set is equal to 12 the what is this instruction set this instruction set is nothing but your opcodes the total number of opcodes or the machine instructions or machine language instructions or simply can also be referred to as instruction set understand carefully sometimes they use different um, you know what we say the terms to represent an instruction uh, to represent an opcode opcode can be directly represented as an opcode or machine instruction or instruction set am i clear so any of these words actually referring to our opcode field okay so here how many opcodes we do have i do have an opcode which is equal to 12 if the opcode is equal to 12 number of opcodes is equal to 12 then the bits for the number of the the, the bits for the opcode field will be equal to 4 because if i have 4 bits in the opcode 
I will be able to represent a maximum of 2 power 4 instruction which is equal to 16. So 4 is sufficient to represent a maximum of 12 opcodes because we do have only 12 opcodes in the system. So 12 opcodes can be represented with a 4 digit. If you do have only 3 digits, you will be able to represent a maximum of only 8 opcodes. So the opcode field will be equal to 4 digits. Then to source register identifiers, meaning there are, I will draw this way, the instruction according to the question, there is one opcode followed by two source register identifiers, meaning two registers, source registers, one destination register identifier, that is one more register which is destination register. So, when an instruction is getting executed, there will be two source operands, one destination operand and these operands will be performed in an operation, used in an operation and finally the result will be transferred to the destination. So, nevertheless, there will be a total of three registers R1, R2, R3 followed by what? A 12-bit immediate value. There is an immediate value, immediate operand which is equal to 12 digits. Okay. So, how many bits are required for the opcode? Opcode bits are equal to 4. How many digits are required for the registers? It depends on the total number of registers in the system. Total number of registers is equal to 64. So, the number of bits per register field is equal to 6. So, it will be equal to 6, 6, 6. So, the total instruction size is equal to 4 opcode digits, 18 register digits, 12 immediate operand digits, which is equal to 34. One instruction size is equal to 34. Am I clear? Then, each instruction must be stored in the memory in a byte aligned fashion. Of course, all the instructions as we already know will get stored in the main memory. When you do have a program, where that program is going to get stored? That program is going to get stored in its origin of, of uh, storage, which is the main memory, right? A program is going to get stored in the main memory. What is a program? A program is a set of instructions, right? So, every instruction is going to get stored in the main memory in the byte aligned fashion. Of course, already you know that memory is a collection of bytes, right? So, I do have a total of 34 bits per instruction. Am I clear? If a program has 100 instructions, the amount of the memory consumed by the program text is what? This is the question. Now, one instruction is equal to 34 bits. There are 100 instructions in a program. So, if there are 100 instructions, what is the amount of memory consumed by the program text is the question. So, what is the answer? So, first of all, we need to understand how many bytes are required for one instruction. Then uh, we can find out how many bytes are required for 100 instructions. I will tell you for 34 bits, I require 4 bytes plus 2 additional digits because 4 bytes is equal to 32 bits plus 2 additional digits. Understand carefully and remember this, even if you do have a single additional digit, you need to procure a complete byte because memory cannot be organized in bitwise. Memory will be organized in the bitewise, byte aligned fashion, every memory. It will organize, it will be organized by the number of bytes. So, even if you want to store a single bit, you need to take a complete byte. Here, I have 32 bits, sorry, I have 34 bits, which requires 4 bytes and 2 additional digits. Even for these 2 additional digits, I require to take 1 additional byte because there is no bitwise organization in the memory. The smallest storage measurement is 1 byte, not 1 bit. Bit is a part of a byte. So, in that light, 1 instruction is equal to 5 bytes. Okay, one instruction is equal to 5 bytes. There are a total of 100 instructions. So, that means 100 into 5, which is equal to 500 bytes is the correct answer for this. Are we clear? Can we go to the next question? Any doubts? If you do have, please let me know. I guess everything is clear. I just am moving to the next question.
I will come back to this question in some time. So this is the question on stack. I will come back to this question in some time. Yeah, let us go to addressing modes. The most suitable addressing mode among the following to write the position independent code is now at this time. Which which point, Warren? Yeah, I'll I'll explain. I got you. I got this. Let me help you. There is no ink on the slide. I'll tell you. See, Warren, understand something. Listen. See, this is my main memory. Okay. How the memory is going to be organized, Warren? Let us understand. Memory will be organized in terms of bytes. First byte, second byte, third byte, so on. Am I clear? Now here, I require to store one digit, only one bit, not uh, seven digits or eight digits or 16 digits. I require to store only one bit. Okay. My value to store in a variable is only one. How many digits to, how many digits are required to store a single one, single integer one? I require hardly one digit, right? But will I be able to use one independent digit in the memory? No, memory cannot be organized as independent bits. Memory will be organized as a complete byte. Okay. So with that, I mean, uh, with respect to that thing, even if you want to store one digit, I require to take one complete byte, which is equal to eight bits. I hope I made my point very clear. Okay. Next question. The most suitable addressing modes among the following to write the position independent code is first of all before I, I explain you this I will tell you I will give you a glimpse of the addressing modes and their usages okay understand carefully after which if you do have any doubts on the addressing modes I do have multiple um, you know YouTube lectures on the addressing modes you just can go through them I clearly explained about the addressing modes but before which before I solve this question I will give you a you know faster glimpse of the addressing modes and their usages okay now understand this there are 10 to 11 standard addressing modes in the advanced computer system there may be hundreds of addressing modes but if you can understand 10 to 11 the standard addressing modes that i'm going to explain you will be able to understand any of the advanced addressing modes because all the addressing modes all the advanced addressing modes are only based on the standardized addressing modes which are which we are going to discuss right now let me tell you the first one is direct addressing mode. Direct addressing mode is used to declare the variables. Second one is indirect addressing mode. Indirect addressing mode is used to declare the pointers. Third one is immediate addressing mode. Immediate addressing mode is used to, uh, you know, define the constants. Fourth one, understand, see why addressing modes are required. You are a programmer, right? While you write a program, you may require to uh, declare a variable or, um, you know, declare a point to, or need to use a loop or you need to make a function call. There may be several features that you want to exploit from the programming. If you want to exploit or enable any of those features of the programming, first of all, that processor must be supporting the addressing modes as follows. For example, if there is no direct addressing mode, for example, in my processor, there is no direct addressing mode. That means even when you are executing a program, you won't be able to declare a variable. Simple. So each of these addressing modes, when, when, when implemented in a processor, when used in a processor by the designer, it is going to enable a specific feature in a programming. So direct addressing mode will enable variable declaration, indirect addressing mode will enable pointers immediate addressing mode enables using the constants and then then um relative addressing mode will enable program relocation what is program relocation program relocation meaning we should be able to branch to the correct address of a program whenever you are executing a program you may call a certain function from main function, you need to call a subroutine. In order to make this subroutine call exactly, we will use several addressing mode. The first one is relative addressing mode. Second one is, sorry, base register addressing mode. By using relative addressing mode and the base register addressing mode, 
we will be able to branch to the exact location within our program. When this one, one of these addressing modes actually are used, understand carefully, our program execution will be just confined to our segment in the main memory. One fundamental rule to access the main memory is you should not access the other's memory space. Whenever your program is getting stored in the main memory, it will be loaded from a base location to a destination location inclusively. So you are allowed, just allowed, just entitled to access only those locations. You are not allowed to go beyond your memory locations. So either this relative addressing mode or base register addressing mode will make sure that your program execution will be confined to accessing the only your main memory locations, but not the others. So relative and base register addressing modes. This, this total phenomena is called program relocation. Relative and the base register addressing mode are for the program relocation. What we told, what I told you, just the thing that I stated is when you are executing a program, the execution should only be limited, should only be confined to access the your own instructions, not the other's instruction. The total phenomena is called program relocation. This program relocation uh, can be done by using either relative addressing mode or base register addressing mode. And next thing is um, auto increment mode, auto decrement mode. As the name suggests, incrementing and decrementing by default automatically when it is going to happen, incrementing and decrementing, decrementing automatically would happen in the loops, right? So auto increment or auto decrement is going to enable or going to enable loops concept of the programming. Are we clear? And next thing is, and finally, what, what else we need to discuss? Yeah, index register addressing mode. Eighth one is index register addressing mode. Index register addressing mode. Understand, look at the term carefully. Where this word index is frequently used in the system, in your programming, where you are going to index arrays. Simple. Index meaning arrays. So, when it comes to the index register addressing mode, it is going to enable the feature of declaring the arrays in the programming. So, understand. Direct addressing mode enables variables. Indirect addressing mode enables pointers. Immediate addressing mode enables constants. Relative addressing mode enables program relocation. Base register addressing mode and um, um, yeah, relative addressing mode enables program relocation. Auto increment, auto decrement enables loops. Index register addressing mode enables address declaration. Remember this, you need to buy hard this. Somehow or the other, I want you people to buy hard this because I just am expecting a question on the addressing mode this time. So the most suitable addressing mode among the following to write the position independent code. What do you mean by the position independent code? Position independent code meaning program relocation, meaning no matter where your program is getting loaded in the main memory, you should be able to access your program only, but not the other's program. So in that context, position independent code meaning program relocation. Okay, program relocation can happen by using uh, relative addressing mode. Actually, program relocation can be done by two, two addressing modes. One is base register and a relative addressing mode. But here, we are going to use relative addressing mode because base register addressing mode is not given in the question. Okay. Next thing. Let the register A. Yeah, this is this is ALU. Okay. Let us solve a question on the ALU. Let the register A contains the value something and the register B contains the value some other thing. An arithmetic addition is performed in the ALU A plus B. What are the values of the flags Z as C after it gets updated as the operation gets finished in the ALU? First of all, every system will have a flag register. The basic flags are for any system. You take any processor. It could be 8086, i3, i7, i5 or um, Intel Pentium or Celeron or, or Qualcomm Snapdragon. Take any media tech or any processor there will be a flag register in that flag register there will be mainly four flags the first one is z second one is s third one is c fourth one is v these are the main flags these are not only the flags there are some other flags also but these are considered to be the main flags what is the z flag z flag meaning this will be equal to one 
whenever the output of the ALU is equal to zero. Z flag stands for what? Z flag stands for a zero flag. Uh, this flag values will be determined by the ALU output. Whenever ALU is producing some value, based on the value, depending on the value, the bits of the flag register will be set. If the ALU output is equal to zero, zero flag will be equal to one. If the ALU output is negative, sign flag will be equal to one because the sign one indicates negative, zero indicates positivity of the value. And carry if, 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 if and only if. The output does have an end carry. What is an end carry, sir? Simple. When two 16 bits are added, if the result is a 17th result, then we have an end carry in this situation. Got my point? So, if the output has an end carry, then carry flag will be equal to 1. Another thing is called overflow flag. What is the overflow flag? Overflow flag meaning accidental reversal of the sign. Under some, you know, special circumstances, sign will be reversed incorrectly. I'll tell you when sign is going to be reversed. For an example, there are two numbers 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. The value of this is positive plus 7. The value of this is plus 7. I am just adding these two numbers. I have a 4 bit CPU. In this 4 bit CPU, my, my word size is equal to only 4 bits in which I am adding two 4 bit values. First value is 0, triple 1 in which most significant digit is positive. Oh, sorry, most significant digit is a sign predominantly and the remaining digits are actually the part of the value. This is plus 7 plus 7. The outcome must be also a positive number, right? But here you can see, unfortunately, the sign will be reversed when you are going to add two positive numbers. Result must also be a positive number, but not a negative number. I hope you got a point. So, but accordingly, when, when we uh, add this, when we perform an addition, 1 plus 1 is equal to 0, 1. 1 plus 1, 1, 1 is equal to 1, 1. 1, 1, 1 is equal to 1, 1. Here, sign digit is getting reversed, right? This is the accidental reversal of the sign. So, during these circumstances, this overflow digit will be set to 1. Overflow digit, when it is going to be set to 1? Whenever the sign is reversed, not by the calculation, but due to an error. This is called overflow digit. So, ZSCV, meaning 0, sign, carry and overflow. 0 flag will be set whenever the ALU output is equal to 0. Sign flag will be set whenever uh, the ALU output is negative. Carry flag will be set whenever the ALU output is, is um, having an additional digit. Overflow flag, flag will be set to 1 whenever there is an accidental reversal of the sign. So, let us, based on this... Um, Based on this uh, discussion, let us solve this question. A condensed value 0, 1, 0, 1. I'll write this value 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Register B contains 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Add them. An arithmetic addition is performed in the ALU. Now, ALU is performing an arithmetic addition. Now, we need to find out the flag register values. What are those? Z s c 0 flag sign flag and carry flag what are the values of z s c let us see now 0 plus 0 is equal to 0 1 plus 0 is equal to 1 0 plus 1 is equal to 1 1 plus 1 is equal to 0 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 1 0 1 okay so here we we are in a situation sign actually accidentally is reversed According to this, we can directly say that carry flag will be, sorry, overflow is not given anyhow. I just am writing one more here. Overflow flag, I mean, uh, overflow flag is not given in the question, but still I am adding an overflow flag because sign is accidentally reversed. The most significant is, uh, the mo most significant bit is going to represent the sign, is going to depict the sign, but the sign is reversed. Two positive numbers are being added, but result is having one in the most significant digit, meaning result is negative. So, or for flag bit will be equal to one. Do we have any carry? No. There are two eight digits. Result also is just limited to confined to only eight digits. Carry flag will be equal to zero. There is no carry at all. 
साइन साइन विल बी इक्वल टू वन यस साइन इज इक्वल टू वन बिकॉज मोस्ट सिग्निफिकेंट डिजिट इज अन इन द रिजल्ट वॉट एवर द मोस्ट सिग्निफिकेंट डिजिट दैट विल गेट ट्रांसफर टू द साइन फ्लैग इन द फ्लैग रजिस्टर फाइनली जीरो फ्लैग विल बी इक्वल टू जीरो बिकॉज द रिजल्ट इज अ नॉन जीरो वैल्यू इफ इट इज अ नॉन जीरो वैल्यू जीरो फ्लैग विल बी इक्वल टू जीरो इफ इट इज अ जीरो वैल्यू जीरो फ्लैग विल बी इक्वल टू वन आई होप आई मेड माई पॉइंट वेरी क्लियर ओके सो द आंसर फॉर जेड एस सी इज इक्वल टू जेड विल बी जीरो एस विल बी वन सी विल बी इक्वल टू जीरो आई होप आई मेड माई पॉइंट क्लियर अब इडन अरुण अरुण एंड हितेश रेस्पॉन्ड कैन यू गो टू नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन The next question is: A certain processor supports only the immediate and the direct addressing mode. Which of the following programming language features cannot be implemented on this processor? Okay, let us understand. A certain processor supports only immediate and the direct addressing modes. The processor supports only two addressing modes. One is immediate. Second one is direct. Okay, what can be enabled by using these two? Immediate enables. What immediate enables, Varun? Arun, could you please let me know? I'll I'll wait for your answer. Immediate and direct addressing modes. When I use these addressing modes, which features of the programming language can be enabled? Any one of you can tell me the answer. Because in a just a short while ago, in the previous slide or just a previous slide ago, I explained you the addressing modes and their purposes. Constant and variable, right? Yes. constants and variables can only be enabled in this processor on this processor nothing else can be possible pointers cannot be possible because pointers required indirect addressing mode arrays requires index addressing mode records requires No, 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 no. See, uh, uh, Tarang, just understand this. Of course, this is a common problem that is being faced by many of the gate aspirants, right? Not only for gate, any competitive exam, first of all, is going to bamboozle your mind, right? Hi, Anusha. It's bamboozle your mind. I'll tell you what. You follow this approach. That is bottom-up approach. Listen to me, Tarang. Are you with me? Not only Tarang. Everyone. This is to everybody. listen to me carefully how you will be able to solve the question see first of all when you look at a question you you go to the question statement finally there will be a question mark right what exactly is being asked in the question that is more important what is asked in the question first you collect that from that you backtrack all the necessary details then the question will immediately be solved because you already prepared you are well prepared but when you go through the question there may be you no know, your mind goes in different direction so in order to avoid that i'll tell you a simple and flexible and very efficient trick that is to track the question statement there will be final one or one word or two word question regardless of how lengthy question it is first you find out the question what exactly is being asked then backtrack to the details segregate the details and collect the details what actually required you will be able to solve use it am i clear tarang anusha arun kumar varun who are you are am i so clear this is very important because most of you people just are confused when you look at the question obviously you are you know you know immense pressure you just need to avoid that but anyhow that is common you are just it is pretty much um, you know acceptable acceptable to be in the pressure but once after you take your papo your pressure will be relieved because you already are in you know a river you just need to swim but i'll tell you a flexible way of swimming you don't need to learn the swimming already you learned a lot i want you people to collect the detail first of all collecting the question am i clear but in the question like which statement is correct is that i face a problem yeah yeah that is of course that if that is your problem that comes only by the preparation i'll tell you one more thing is one more thing that is that is um multiple choice questions right solve as many pyqs as possible solve as many pyqs as possible that will solve your problem because pyqs will give you a 
different dimension to every topic by the pyqs we can see the actual flavor of the uh, actual subject i don't want you people even for going to the you know practice question forget about the practice question just go through the pyqs as many as possible for every topic you can do better clear okay so um, see all of you understand this let me put this way records what is the record record meaning we require a data structure right anusha tell me lokesh tell me tarun tell me if i have to implement a record first of all i need to use a data structure right i may be i may yeah yeah i will i will i mean listen. later i'll i'll explain them okay I, i do have a few msq questions when i go through them i'll i'll explain them understand are you with me everyone i have around 30 people with me is everyone with me right now you say yes i just i'm going to explain an important thing right now henceforth we are going to you know get into the most complex questions okay fine see first of all in order to implement this records we require to have a data structure right simple records can be i mean how you will be able to maintain the records records in c will definitely use a pointer and arrays or else directly i can put in a table i can organize it as an array a record can be organized by using a linked list but first of all predominantly record requires the data structure right clear what exactly what is the basic prerequisite of a data structure you know to use any data structure think carefully i require a pointer right is that no simple if you ever want to implement records first of all records is a data structure any data structure requires a pointer is it possible is it possible without an indirect addressing mode to implement a record no it is not possible data structures are tightly coupled on the pointers so records can never be implemented without a pointer at all without an indirect addressing mode at all okay so records requires indirect addressing mode so records also are not possible next thing is recursive procedures with the local variables forget about recursive procedures i can't explain you right now because it's lengthy one i want to ask you people a question everyone taran anusha soumya lokesh taran who you are answer one question where a local variable of a program is going to get stored where a local variable of a program is going to get stored sir where are you people are do i have the programmers with me computer science people with me or somebody else understand carefully listen are you listening no listen surya wonderful local variables will get stored into the stack nevertheless listen to me all of you carefully in the main memory there are four segments there are four logical segments as divided by my operating system the first one is the text section second one is data section the third one is stack section and the fourth one is heap section am i clear now the thing is what is the text section when you are executing a program this program's instructions will get stored in the text section the program's global variables i would say global variables will get stored in the data section program's local variables will get stored in the stack section i would say lv local variables will get stored in the stack section heap the program's dynamic variable class level variables will get stored in the heap section what is the i mean calloc malloc in in uh, c i hope you remember right calloc malloc when you use them is going to dynamically allocate the memory only during the run time those variables will get stored in the heap section am i clear text meaning instructions data meaning global variables stack meaning local variables and heap meaning dynamic variables so with respect to this what is the answer answer uh, for this is um you know which are the following programming language features cannot be implemented on this processor no see local variables in our to what do you call um store a local variables i require a stack see without a pointer will you be able to access a stack madam will you be able to access a stack sir without a pointer am i entitled to access a stack yes i do have a stack but can i open the door without a pointer somebody answer me Uh, am i audible and visible without a stack 
we won't be able to access the stack because access to the stack will only be initiated by using something called a stack pointer. Screen not clear. Why screen is not clear? Is it uh, for everyone the same problem? Do you face the same problem? Is the screen is not clear? But no, I don't think so. My screen is completely visible. I guess everyone confirm. Okay then. Uh, I guess um, Anusha, please refresh your page. Maybe you know uh, internet bandwidth issue. Okay, simple. Finally, coming back to the question: If I ever have to use a stack, first of all, I need a stack point. Okay. Can I go to the next question? So simple. Not, none of these programming features can be enabled in a processor uh, in which only the direct addressing mode and the immediate addressing modes are, are uh, implemented. Going to the next question, understand. This is an important question. This is an important question. Question on an ALU. Okay. To answer this question, first of all, something should be imprinted in your brain. Because ALU may lead to some complexity, but I, I took several sessions on the YouTube explaining the whole structure of the ALU. But anyhow, I can't ask you people to go back and uh, access all those lectures. Anyhow, I'll give you a simple uh, rough sketch of the ALU. Let us say this is the ALU. But generally in any processor, remember this. Remember this. Okay. In any processor, of course, there is a main memory. But in order to communicate with the main memory, I will have two registers. One is address register. Second one is data register can otherwise also to be referred to as memory address register and a memory data register. See, in order to communicate with my main memory, any processor, any advanced processor, right from 8085, not even 8086, right from 8085 till i9, the standardized procedure is, I will have one memory address register, one memory data register. These registers are connected to the main memory. Why these registers are used? Simple. In order to locate something in the main memory, I do require an address. That address will be transferred. I'm a CPU, okay? I'm a CPU. For example, there is Lokesh, who is my address register. There is Soumya, who is my data register. Lokesh is my uh, memory address register. Soumya is my memory data register. These are the two intermediate guys always I use whenever I want to access main memory. So, whenever I want to access main memory, I will have an address. That address I will give to Lokesh. Lokesh is an address register. He will go to the uh, uh, specific address of the main memory. And inside, I do have a data element. That data element will be transferred to the memory data register, which happened to be Soumya. Clear? So, these two people are the mediators in between the CPU and the main memory. So CPU, whenever it wants to communicate with the main memory, it uses the address register. It gives an address to the address register, taking which address register goes to the main memory and transfers the content from that address to the data register. And the data register collects it back to the CPU. You just need to keep it in your mind. Okay. So in order to communicate with the main memory, I will have a separate bus system, memory bus system. Okay, to, to communicate with the processors, look, once again, Lokesh, share. Ravina, some people saying the screen screen is not clear. Please, I want you people to rush it because I have a 100 Mbps uh, uh, connection, I don't know. Reading out the question takes a lot of time because we have only two sessions already. We are running out of the time. Lokesh Yadav, I'll repeat. Understand carefully. Lokesh. See. Let me erase this. Okay. All of you, stay focused and be here. Yes, yes, yes. I'm repeating. 
okay these are registers these are the cpu registers this is main memory generally any cpu uses two bus systems one is to communicate with main main, main memory okay one is to communicate with the cpu registers one is local bus system and one more is external bus system to the memory so this bus system is called a memory bus this bus system is called a register bus okay so if i have to make a transfer in between register to the register i will use the register bus system if i have to make a transfer between register to the main memory i will use a, a what do you call memory bus system are we clear suraj lokesh and ravina somya are we clear we will use two bus systems when i want to communicate with my main memory i will use the memory bus when i have to communicate with the local process registers i will use the register bus system generally clear everyone pre am i audible visible what clear right okay let me erase this now based on this okay see understand consider the following data path of a simple non pipeline cpu listen to me just follow the footprints that's it i one prerequisite is i do not want you people to go ahead and stumble upon i want you people to follow exactly the footsteps in the, when i am taking you you people just follow me that's it that that is the prerequisite i will tell you that you will be able to solve any question based on the details okay consider the following data path of a simple non pipeline cpu okay cpu is non pipeline there are no segments in the cpu the registers a b a1 a2 memory data register and the bus and the alu are 8 bit wide so registers a register b okay uh, a1 a2 memory data register where is memory data register yes this is the memory data register the bus this is the bus system and the alu alu also is of 8 bits okay the total size is 8 bits these registers the register that i have selected right now a2 a1 b a and mdr are 8 bits register okay the mux is of the size 8 into 2 is to 1 understand carefully whenever you are provided with the details of multiplexer and um, demultiplexer of an alu directly ignore them this is not our business computer organization or architecture will never talk about the multiplexer demultiplexer size of the alu that is completely irrelevant to the question that is somewhere related to the dld and the design of the digital logic completely you need you need to ignore the multiplexer size demultiplexer size within the alu you need to ignore this we don't need this each memory operation takes two cpu clock cycles whenever you want to access main memory memory access takes two clock cycles two clock cycles and uses mar and mdr accordingly the cpu instructions push r where r is equal to a or b as a specification r needs to get transferred to memory of sp sp is going to get decremented okay sp can be decremented locally how many cpu clock cycles are needed to execute the push r instructions we need to execute push r instruction all of you looking at a total you know length of the question you may be feeling that this is one of the difficult question ever no it is not a difficult question if you understand it carefully it's a simple question i will tell you how simply you will be able to solve it okay how many cpu clock cycles are needed to execute the push r instruction i need to perform push r what is push operation push operation meaning the value of r should get transferred to memory of sp what is memory of sp there is a register stack point okay stack pointer register in the stack pointer there is a value okay when i say r is the r will get transferred to memory of sp sp will be taken as an address and taking this address memory will get accessed r will get transferred to 
that memory location so memory of sp is going to take a value from r did i make it myself clear if you do have any doubts please ask me r is equal to sp if i say r gets transferred to sp the value of r will get transferred to stack point o if i say r gets transferred to memory of sp sp now is holding a memory address taking that address we need to go to the main memory and in that main memory location the contents of the r will get transferred to am i clear okay so in order to execute this operation how many clock cycles actually are required so understand as i already told you when i want to make a transfer to the main memory i require two people one is address register one more is data register am i clear one is address register one more is data register here i am transferring a content what is the trans what is the content the content that i am going to transfer is r what is r r is either a or b okay the contents of register a for an example needs to be transferred to memory of sp for this understand carefully address register should be loaded with the stack point okay in order to access the main memory i always will use two people one is address register to access the main memory i require an address that address will be transferred to the address register then the content either it is getting transferred to the memory or received from the main memory will get transferred to the data register so if you can understand this the rest of the things will be very simple stack point o should be stored in the address register and address register the value of the address register will be located in the main memory taking that address under that location the content will get transferred to the data register okay so um sorry r is getting transferred to memory of sp sorry sorry just a small correction small correction bigger pardon yeah the value of r should be transferred to the data register that is first of all address is getting transferred from stack pointer to the address register the data that gets transferred to the main memory first of all will get transferred to the data register so initially to make this memory transfer stack pointer should be transferred to the address register and the value of r should be transferred to the data register already r is interpreted as a so in order to have this transfer done how many clock cycles actually are required so from stack pointer to the address register to make a transfer if both sides are equal i will require only one clock cycle but let us see what is the size of the address register what is the size of the stack point o? what is the size of the stack point o? stack pointer and memory address register are 16 bit registers okay so stack pointer should be transferred to the address register both are equal to 16 bits but the thing is the bus system what is the bus system the bus system is only of 8 bits bus system can transport only 8 bits at a time am i clear so initially to make this transfer stack pointer should be transferred to the address register stack pointer and address register both are equal to 16 bits but i do have only an 8 bit bus system so what can i do i require two clock cycles for this because i need to transfer initially 8 bits of the address uh, address to the address register next remaining 8 bits will get transferred in the next next phase okay so in order to transfer 16 bits to a 16 bit register using a 8 bit bus system i require two clock cycles so two clock cycles for this and then a must be transferred to the data register there is no problem here because data register and a are just only equal to eight digits each is equal to eight digits so i require only one clock cycle so two clock cycles to load the address register one clock cycle is to load the data register and then memory access according to the question according to the details will take two more clock cycles so three plus two is equal to a total of five clock cycle i do require i hope you got the entire point here i need to make a transfer to the memory for which i need to place an address into the address register this transfer will take two clock cycles because stack pointer and address register is of 16 digits but bus system is only of eight digits in an eight bits bus system 
Is it possible to transfer the entire 16 bits at a stretch? No. It must be divided into two phases. I require two clock cycles. Then A must get transferred to the data register. You have no problem because there is no problem because data register and A is just is of only 8 bits. So it requires only one clock cycle. 1 plus 2 is equal to 3 to load the address register and data register. Finally, to access the main memory, according to the question, it is just only two clock cycles. See, two total five clock cycles only. Somebody can ask me, sir, there is one more operation here. Only for the first operation, you told it is five clock cycles. What about second operation? Second operation also, um, you know, requires some clock cycles, right? But you don't need to worry because it is given that SP can be decremented locally. That means SP is a register which can perform the operations local to itself. Decrement operation is going to be performed within the stack pointer locally without affecting any other operation. So, whenever any operation getting performed in any register locally, that doesn't affect the total number of clock cycles because this operation can be performed in parallel to this operation which is taking five clock cycles right i hope you got a point the total number of clock cycles for this operation is equal to five are we clear can you go to the next question sir Somebody please answer Satvik, Ghosh, or Lokesh, Arun Kumar. Are we so clear? If you do have, if you are caught up in anything, I want you people to time immediately because you got no time. Tomorrow also, we do have one more session on operating systems at 10 o'clock. I want you people to join there because I just I'm going to solve many doubts, especially because most of the people are asking me to, uh, you know, give a comprehensive idea about a synchronization because most of the people, they are thinking that the synchronization is one of the topic that is uh, more complex in the perspective. Okay, so tomorrow I am going to take a comprehensive session on the operating system, but more uh, preference will be given to the synchronization topic. Okay, so next question is consider a risk machine where each instruction is exactly four bytes long. Consider conditional, unconditional branch instruction uses PC relative addressing mode with offset specified in bytes to the target location of the branch instruction. Further, the offset is always with respect to the address of the next instruction in the program sequence. Consider the following instruction sequence. These are the four instructions. If the target of the branch instruction is i, then the decimal value of the offset is. First of all, without getting into the details, understand how the effective address is going to get calculated in the relative addressing mode. In the relative addressing mode, effective address is equal to program counter value plus offset within the instruction program counter value and the value that is specified in instruction which is going to give you the effective address okay now with respect to this what is the answer see there are four instructions understand risk architecture risk um, you know systems always are equal to 32 bits all the risk systems are 32 bits 32 bits meaning four bytes clear so all these instructions are getting stored in the memory in a four byte aligned fashion. One byte, one, one word is equal to four bytes. Clear? So I have first instruction, second instruction, third instruction, fourth instruction. Now, when you look at the question, where is this? If the target of the branch instruction is I, you can see this is the branch instruction. BUQ meaning branch if equal okay so fourth instruction is a branch instruction for this branch instruction target instruction is i okay so when fourth instruction is getting executed a branch will be taken to i okay so if it is so what will be the offset here we need to find out the offset value so simple things are simple in the relative addressing mode the effective address will be calculated as program counter value plus offset so here already offset i'm um, sorry program counter value we know we will be able to know very simply we need to find out what is the offset so how the program counter value 
is to be determined, is to be found out. Simple. In a risk architecture, one word is equal to 32 bits. Okay. And one word will get four addresses. Since it follows byte addressing. I hope you know byte addressing and word addressing. Do you know byte addressing and word addressing? Sujay, Suraj, location, everyone who is following the session. Do you know the difference between byte addressing and the word addressing? Everyone. Okay, so first address will be 0 and first instruction will get 4 addresses, right? When you write a program, when you write a program, it is assumed always that your first instruction will have a starting address 0. Generally, it is not true. But when you write an instruction, you will assume that the first address will be 0, right? So first address will be 0, second address will be 4 because first instruction itself, it takes 4 addresses. Second address is 4. Third address is 8, fourth address is 12. For this program counter value will be equal to 16. Am I clear? For this program counter value will be equal to 16. What is the program counter value? Program counter is the address of the next instruction. Am I right? Please correct me if I'm wrong. Program counter is a specific register in, in a special purpose register in a CPU always stores the address of the next instruction. What is the address of the next instruction? Address of the next instruction is equal to 16. So here simple. In the relative addressing mode, effective address is equal to program counter value plus offset of the instruction, offset of the branch instruction. Am I clear? So, program counter value is equal to 16 plus what is the offset? Offset must be equal to x. When both are added, effective address is taken. What is the effective address? According to the question, effective address is the address of i because branch is going to i. What is the ith address? Ith address is equal to 0. 0 is equal to 16 plus x value. What should be the x value? x value should be minus 16. Right? Is that no? x value should be minus 16. Am I clear? Everyone in this session. Hey, only a few people are responding. Rest of the people, uh, am, I, am I audible, visible completely? With all the wills and wits you're following, or just you know, for the namesake you're following, you don't give a half hearted approach. If you do have any doubts, I want you people to shoot up immediately. I will be able to answer as simple as this. So, I'll go to the next question. Yeah, consider the following sequence of the micro operations program. Mm, see, yeah, follow me carefully. Consider the following sequence of micro operation program counter is getting transferred to MBR, X is getting transferred to MAR. Y is getting transferred to PC, MBR being transferred to the memory. Okay. Understand when you look at this, program counter value is being saved, right? Program counter value is being saved under only two circumstances. All of you, please listen to me. Is everyone with me? Is everyone with me or not? You say yes, all of you. Give at least one uh, emoji of your choice. I would consider that you people are active and alive. Some emoji. Very good. Okay, listen to me carefully. See, all of you, keep it in your mind. Program counter value can be saved only under two circumstances. One is branch and one more is interrupts. Okay. Now, in the branches, program counter will be stored in the stack. Okay. For the interrupts, program counter will be saved in memory. It could be memory stock also, but when the program counter value is being saved and that too into the memory, it's just nothing but the interrupt, okay? Am I clear? Program counter value will be saved 
under only two special circumstances we never will store the program counter value ever never ever 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 the program counter value is expected to be stored except two circumstances the first one is the branches second one is interests in the branches program counter is saved within the local registers or the local stack of the cpu but the program counter if it is being transferred to the memory of course that it is just nothing but due to the arrival or an occurrence of an interrupt as simple as this are we clear so here when you look at this program counter is getting transferred to memory buffer register this memory buffer register is getting transferred to the memory now tell me what is the answer program counter eventually is being transferred to memory what does it mean what is the correct option for this what is the correct option this program counter being transferred to the memory being saved in the memory option a b c d which one is only there see obviously these two are ruled out only there are only two possibilities if a program counter is being saved there are only two possibilities one it may be the conditional branch or initiate the interrupt service conditional branch we never save the program counter value in the memory we will save all the time the program counter value only in the pc stack cpu stack but understand if you use older versions 8085 or before the versions there was no stack at all 8085 there might be a stack but before the versions of 8085 there is no stack at that time there are separate special cpu registers used but nevertheless understand this program counter value will be saved in the cpu register or the stack in the case of a branches it will get transferred to the memory in the case of a interrupts so option d is correct Suppose a processor does not have any stack pointer register. Stack pointer register meaning even if there is a stack, you won't be able to access the stack. Okay. This is the I mean, simple. You have a wardrobe that is locked. You threw the lock out. Will you be able to access the wardrobe? Am I clear? Everyone? Are you are you? Accessing stack without a stack pointer just is pretty similar to accessing a wardrobe without a key after it is locked. So, even though there is a stack without a stack pointer, it is useless. So, there is no stack. Eventually, this states that there is no stack. If there is no stack, understand carefully, stack is an effective way for the function calls. Effective way, I just am telling you, effective and efficient way. I cannot tell you the total details right now. For that, you need to access my previous classes. If I use a stack, act, I mean, function calls will be faster. Subroutine calls will be faster. Interrupts will be faster. But without a stack, world doesn't end. There are some other measures, some other provisions, which make still function calls and interrupts happen, but maybe slower. The other methods are not as quick as using a stack. Stack is not there, but world doesn't end. So, according to which, it cannot have a subroutine call instruction. No wrong. Even without a stack, subroutine call can be implemented. But slower. It can have subroutine call instruction. No. Option D is correct directly. Everything is possible, but slower. Results are not as quicker as we expected. When you execute a program, you need to take a nap. And when you wake up, uh, your program output may be visible. Am I clear? Option D is correct. Are we clear? Even without a stack, subroutine calls and returns are absolutely possible. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Listen to me carefully. Just I forgot one thing. I'll, 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 I forgot only one thing. The thing is, without a stack, recursion is not possible, sir. Under no circumstances, without a stack, recursion can be implemented. No, simple. You will not be able to exploit the mean of recursion without a stack. If the processor doesn't support stack, recursion can never, ever, ever, ever be possible at all. Are we clear? Except recursion, everything is possible. So, if we exclude recursion, option D is the correct answer. Are we clear? Are we clear?
<coughs> most of the people they fall uh, under the exact trap that they've been set to set uh, in this question sir nested subroutines means recursion nest arun kumar why nested subroutine is a recursion understand a calls b b calls c c calls d is a nested subroutine but recursion is c is calling c c is calling c c is calling c if a function calls itself repeatedly that comes under recursion not repeatedly if i call myself that comes under recursion right can somebody correct me tanushri or or uh, savik or lokesh am i right what is recursion sir i have the best programmers with me am i right you people are the best programmers in the world right of course you are expected to be right yeah recursion meaning it is not nested subroutine call a function calling itself is nothing but a recursion but recursion can never be possible made possible without using a strand now this is the question this is the question which is considered to be very easy but 90% of the people marked wrong to this marked a wrong answer to this simple cpu always has two modes any cpu uh if i have to extend it there may be more than two modes right now some operating system follows multiple modes that is a multi mode operating system but i am not talking about the multi mode operating system right now but we just start, just confine our our dis discussion only to a cpu which has only two modes that is user mode and the second one is kernel mode user mode and a kernel mode what is the user mode user mode meaning simply i will explain all the instructions other than printf is are going to get executed in the user mode but whenever there is a printf printf will only get executed in the kernel mode am i clear kernel mode meaning whenever cpu is offering you some services that will only get executed the services will only be executed in the kernel mode printf is a service set why printf is going to provide you an access to the additional resources rather you know io resources io resources can never be accessed by you directly io resources can be accessed and be your have by the operating system or the cpu there only be will done will be done in a kernel mode but understand in order to change the mode from the user to kernel i require a software enter whenever i use a software interrupt the mode will get switched from user to kernel mode understand carefully cpu has uh, two modes privileged and non privileged you can say privileged is a uh, kernel mode non privileged is user mode now the thing is most of the people they um, chose software interrupt thinking that the mode is changing from kernel to use, uh, user to kernel but here he is asking kernel to user not user to kernel if it is user to kernel software interrupt is needed but kernel to user software interrupt is not required no interrupt is required did you get me so option d is correct a non privileged instruction with gen doesn't generate no interrupt is actually required did i make myself clear we require software interrupt only to switch the mode from the user mode to the kernel mode not white versa white versa in order to change the mode from the kernel to user i ain't need no interrupt at all am i clear so option d is correct but 80% of the people they stuck to the software interrupt which is obviously wrong answer software interrupt changes the mode from user to kernel but here it is as kernel to user am i clear yes sir no are you people are with me yes sir no very good in the absolute addressing mode what is absolute addressing mode absolute addressing mode is just nothing but a direct addressing mode in the direct addressing mode option b is correct the address of the operand is inside the instruction sir what subject you teach in paid classes of course i teach operating systems i teach um, computer architecture i teach also you know 
uh, PNDs, Programming and Data Structures. Okay, option B is correct. I'm not wasting any more time because these are the simple questions here. I will, I would rather want to explain because since we do have a less time, I want you people to go to pipeline. Okay, because I'm expecting some questions from pipelining. Since memory is one of the easiest topic, I am taking pipelining. So we will finish as many as possible in pipelining. Okay, are you listening? I just am going to give you a few, um, you know, rules, a few protocols, whatever you call, to understand and solve any question in the pipeline. Shall we start? Everyone, again, some emoji, please. Let us start a new topic, pipelining. Are you everyone? Is it only half an hour? Meanwhile, to start pipelining. Understand carefully that when it comes to the pipelining, all the questions are expected to be very simple because there are no such. Yep, I will explain. Uh, Lokesh, you've been waiting for this, right? Anyhow, I'll tell you. Uh, some formulas of the pipeline. The first one is F. F is equal to 1 by T. Or T is equal to 1 by F. Sir, um, to know this formula, I don't require your classes. That may be your idea, but I will I will need to start from this. Frequency is equal to 1 by T. T is equal to 1 by F. This is the first two formula. Second formula for the pipelining is time required to execute a process in a non-pipeline system. That is time in a non-pipeline system is equal to n into tn. Am I clear? Time required to execute in a non-pipeline system is equal to n into tn, where n is number of instructions or tasks, tn is number of clock cycles per task okay and t pipeline system okay i would say t pipeline front task is equal to k plus n minus 1 into tp okay See, this is very simply, this can be very simply perceived. You just please, I, I request you people to go through at least the pipeline topic. Before you go to the gate exam, I, I mean, there is a pipeline topic I have taken in the, in the earlier classes. Yep. K plus N minus 1 into TP. I expect a lot of questions from pipeline. That's the reason why I just want you, I, I want you people to go through the pipeline topic where, where I explained it on the concept very, I mean, in a simplified manner. Here, K is number of segments. Okay. N is number of tasks. Okay. TP is time per segment okay in a pipeline system pipeline time can be given as pipeline time can be given as k plus n minus 1 into tp what is n n is the number of tasks k is the number of segments tp is a segment delay are we clear understand clear Und understand understand this lokesh hold on i will explain everything clearly so, in order to demonstrate this, understand there is a non pipeline system which takes four uh, clock cycles per instruction. For instruction, it takes four clock cycles. Let us take same pipeline, same uh, system has been divided into a four segmented pipeline. Am I clear? A four segmented pipeline where each segment takes one clock cycle. Understand carefully, all of you. See, the generally, 
the speed up will be non pipeline system divided by pipeline system let us take for n number of process let us take n is equal to 100 okay now when i say speed up speed up is non pipeline system divided by pipeline system right what is n n is equal to 100 into what is tn tn is time required in a non pipeline system per task per task is equal to 4 clock cycles 100 into 4 is equal to 400 but in a pipeline system it is k plus n minus 1 into tp what is k k is equal to the number of segments which is equal to 4 plus k what is i'm sorry n what is n n is the number of tasks which is equal to 100 minus 1 into tp what is tp tp is the segment delay each and every segment are having uniform delays so tp is equal to 1 but you can ask me sir what if different segments has different delays at that time tp will be equal to maximum segment delay for an example this is one this is two this is three this is one so at that time tp will become three am i clear now i will tell you sir how tp can be calculated tp is max stage delay plus max register delay sir okay we understood what is maximum stage delay from where uh, these registers have come in between yes exactly you are there these registers have come in between because each and every stage will have an intermediate registers rather each and every pair of stage will need to have an intermediate register am i clear okay and the first stage there is a second stage between v2 there is an intermediate register i will produce an output i will transfer to this intermediate register from that intermediate register the data will be given as an input to the next stage so in between the stages of the pipelines there will be one intermediate register so if it is a four stage pipeline there will be four intermediate registers because there is only one more intermediate register required after the final segment to take the output so if it is the n segment pipeline the number of uh, intermediate registers will also be equal to n so here even to store and retrieve the information from the registers also takes some delay so the tp is equal to max stage delay plus max register delay are we clear are we clear so this is the thing let me erase this yeah in a con conventional pipeline system um <clears throat> this is t1 time required in a non pipeline system in a pipeline system is tp is equal to k plus n minus 1 into tk are we clear are we clear and the next thing is speed up is n into tn divided by k plus n minus 1 into tp understand carefully here there are two shortcuts to solve any question that is understand carefully listen to me if the number of tasks n is given speed up is n into tn divided by k plus n minus 1 into tp if the number of tasks is not not given speed up is just limited to tn divided by tp only did you get me you need to use this formula n into t1 divided by k plus n minus 1 into tp when the number of tasks are given if the number of tasks are not given you don't bother about n r k plus n minus 1 the total speed up will just be limited to tn divided by tp i hope i made myself very clear yes or no when the number of tasks are not known the speed up will be equal to tn divided by tp only am i clear yes i i will directly solve some questions okay um the stage delays in a four stage pipeline 800 500 400 and 300 picoseconds the first stage uh, with a delay 800 picoseconds is replaced with a functional equivalent design involving two stages with respect to 600 and 350 picoseconds the throughput increase of the pipeline is dash percent which is the question here the question is simple the stage delay 
a four stage pipeline are 800 500 400 and 300 picoseconds see there are two pipelines pipeline 1 and pipeline 2 first pipeline delays are there are four stages 800 500 400 and 300 okay the first stage is divided into two functionally equivalent um, sorry two functionally equivalent design involving two stages with respect to delay 600 and 350 picoseconds that is in p2 pipeline 2 first stage is divided into two stages with latencies of 600 and 350 followed by 500 400 and 300 the throughput increase of the pipeline is dash percent what is the throughput increase see first of all what is tp tp is the maximum segment delay right tp of the first pipeline was 800 tp of the next pipeline is 600 because the maximum delay in the first one is 800 maximum delay in the next pipeline was 600 now understand what is throughput Several times I told you um, in any of my previous lectures for any number of times, what is the throughput? Throughput is number of instructions per second. Am I clear? Number of instruction per second. So here in the pipeline one, number of instruction per second that gets executed is 1 by 800. Because 800 picoseconds right for 800 picoseconds i will execute one instruction okay and in the next pipeline number of instruction per second will become 1 by 600 am i clear now what is the throughput throughput is old design divided by new design i'll tell you throughput increase is equal to old delay minus new delay that is 1 by 800 minus 1 by 600 divided by new de sorry old delay 1 by 800 into 100 so one instruction is getting executed in 800 picoseconds one instruction is getting executed in 600 picoseconds in the new system divided by old system delay which is equal to 1 by 800 into 100 which is equal to 33.33 percent which is the actual pipeline throughput improvement time am i clear yes or no see understand what is the pipeline time there are no instructions when you simply go through a plain pipeline with an empty pipeline what is the what is what is the pipeline time pipeline time meaning a maximum segment delay sir I hope I made my point very clear. Maximum segment delay is the pipeline time. Okay, I'll tell you the throughput. <laughs> you go to a bank. You go to a bank. There are four counters. First counter takes one minute. Second counter takes two minutes. Third counter takes three minutes. Fourth counter takes one minute. What is the pipeline time here? Pipeline time is three minutes, sir. I'll tell you why. All of you be focused and understand. When you go to a bank uh, teller's counter, when you go to a bank branch, you need to go through four teller counter for an instance. First teller counter will take one minute. Second teller counter will take two minutes. Third teller counter will take three minutes. Fourth teller counter will take only one minute. Did you get it? So understand carefully. For everyone, on an average, it will take only three minutes. After the first guy, for every other guy, it requires three minutes for finishing. You just stand outside and count the times, time intervals of the outputs. First guy will come at 1 plus 2, 3, 3 plus 3, 6, 6 plus 1, 7. At the seventh clock pulse, in the seventh minute, first guy will come out. Second guy will come out at the tenth minute. Third guy will come out at the thirteenth minute. I hope I made my point very clear. So the pipeline time is equal to the maximum segment delay, which is equal to three at that case here in this case here yeah here in this case it is 
30 earlier it was 1 by 800 now it is 1 by 600 the difference is 33.33 oh next one i just need to important yeah consider a non pipeline processor with a clock rate of 2.5 gigahertz and an average cycles per instruction of 4 okay let us solve this question i am just explaining some complex questions here because we are running out of the time consider a non pipeline processor with a clock rate of 2.5 gigahertz and an average cycles per instruction of 4 here um frequency of the pipeline is equal to 2.5 gigahertz and one instruction takes four clock pulse okay so this is pipeline one consider a non pipeline process uh, consider a non pipeline processor sorry it is processor one in the processor one frequency is equal to 2.5 and one instruction is taking four clock cycles in a pipeline processor a uh, same processor upgrade to the pipeline processor with the five stages now you have we do have five stages but due to the internal pipeline delay the clock speed is reduced to 2 gigahertz now here frequency is just reduced to 2 gigahertz okay assume that there are no stall cycles in the pipeline what is the speed up achieved in this pipeline processor i told you what is the speed up when there are no instructions given speed up is equal to non pipeline system time divided by pipeline system time what is tn tn is equal to 4 clock cycles okay pipeline system pipeline system it is divided into with five stages five stages meaning of course in a pipeline system on an average it is expected to take only one clock cycle okay so it is 4 by 1 which is equal to 4 but it is not at um, completely done the speed up is equal to what is 4 4 into what is clock cycle clock cycle is equal to time right time is given not directly rather indirectly in terms of the frequency how frequent what is the relationship between time and the frequency time is equal to 1 by f right so 4 into 1 by 2.5 divided by 1 by 2 because one clock cycle in the next pipeline is equal to 2 so that is equal to 4 by 2.5 divided by 1 by 2 4 by sorry 4 by 2.5 into 2 which is equal to 8 by 2.5 which is equal to 3.2 3.2 is the correct option am i clear all of you am i clear or you want me to repeat everyone yes manasa share i will repeat it for one more time yeah understand carefully there are two processes manasa understand this this is first processor it is a non pipeline processor which is a plain processor i would say p1 there is one more processor which has five segments understand in general pipeline system time for instruction will only be equal to one clock cycle one clock cycle for every instruction it will take in a pipeline system unless specified otherwise one clock cycle so nothing else is given in the question so we need to assume that the pipeline system tp is equal to one clock cycle okay tp is always equal to one clock cycle in any pipeline system if there are no stall cycles if there are stall cycles there will be some additional clock cycles added but in general if there are no clock if there are no stalls in a pipeline system for every operation or instruction it takes only one clock cycle am i clear manasa i hope so non pipeline system it is given as four clock cycles okay 
what is clock cycle clock cycle is a time right but time is time directly given no rather it is given in the frequency so we can use t is equal to 1 by f so t is equal to um 1 by 2.5 so one clock cycle is equal to 1 by 2.5 here okay so here one clock cycle one clock cycle here in the pipeline system is equal to 1 by frequency what is the frequency in the pipeline system the frequency in the pipeline system is equal to 2 so tp is equal to 1 by 2 1 into 1 by 2 which is equal to 1 by 2 in a non pipeline system tn the number of clock cycles is equal to 4 and each clock cycle is equal to 1 by 2.5 in a pipeline system for every process it takes only one clock cycle and a clock cycle is equal to 1 by 2 okay so the thing is speed up how you are going to calculate the speed up speed up is equal to non pipeline system non pipeline system is equal to 4 into tn what is tn tn is equal to 1 by 2.5 Divide by pipeline time. What is the pipeline time? TP. TP is equal to 1 by 2, which is equal to 8 point, sorry. 8 divided, uh, yeah. 8 divided by 2.5, which is equal to 3.2 is the speed up of the pipeline. Clear? Yes, sir, no. Manas, sir. Okay, a four stage pipeline has a stage delays 150, 120, 160, and 140 nanoseconds respectively. Registers that are used between the stages have a delay of 5 nanoseconds each. Assuming constant clocking rate, the total time taken to process 1000 data items on this pipeline will be how much? Simple. What is pipeline time? n processes is equal to k plus n minus 1 into tp right here what is k k is the number of segments what is the number of segments 1 2 3 4 what is the number of and what is n n is the number of tasks number of tasks is uh, what where thousand minus 1 4 in 4 plus 1000 minus 1 into tp what is tp tp is as i told you max stage delay plus max register delay so what is the max stage delay here max stage delay here is 160 plus max register delay in between the stages there are intermediate registers always you know takes 5 nanoseconds each meaning 160 plus 5 since each resistor is taking equal number of uh, delay clock cycles which is equal to 5 160 plus 5 is equal to 165 nanoseconds so 4 plus 1000 minus 1 into tp what is tp tp is equal to 165 nanoseconds which is equal to uh, this is this is 1003 into 165 i'll calculate and tell you 165.5 microseconds the question is asked in the microseconds so 165.5 microseconds is the correct answer for this are we clear next question these are the simplest questions Yeah, uh, we will solve one more question before we leave. Consider a 3 gigahertz processor with a 3 stage pipeline and a stage latency is V1, V2 and V3 such that V1 is equal to 3 V2 by 4 is equal to 2 V3. If the longest pipeline stage is split into two pipeline stages of equal latency, then new frequency is dash gigahertz ignoring the delays in the pipeline registers. 165, 160.5. Thank you for correcting. It may be 
this is given in the microseconds that must be 1003 into 165 into 10 power minus 3 calculate this 1003 into 165 into 10 power minus 3 you need to calculate because the answer is as in the, the microseconds than nanoseconds whatever the answer it may be 160.5 or 165.5 but this is 1003 into 165 into 10 power minus 3 whatever the answer it might be yeah <clears throat> Yeah, Tanush Shridhari, I, I guess, of course, it is uh, 165.5 is the correct answer. Consider a 3 gigahertz processor with a 3-stage pipeline and a stage latency is V1, V2, V3. There are 3 stages. Okay. Segment 1, segment 2, and segment 3. Yep. 165.5. Uh, when you round, round it off, uh, it will come to 5, right? Segment 1, segment 2, segment 3, come back. We have a very, very less time. V1, V1, 3V2 by 4, 2V3. Yes, understand. Delays of the pipeline are not directly given. Rather, they are given in a relationship. So, how are we going to interpret this relationship? V1, the first stage delay is 3 fourth of the second stage delay and uh, double than the third stage delay. If I can draw a relationship, I can, I can define the relationship as um 4x 8x and 3x uh, no no 6x 8x 3x even if you take lcm 6x 8x 3x so stage 1 has a 3 fourth delay of mm, to, uh, to, uh, stage 2 which is 8 which is of 8x and double the delay of s3 so, stage 1 is of 6x, stage 2 is of 8x, stage 3 is of 3x latency. Now, here what is the TP? What is the TP of this pipeline, sir? Can somebody please answer me? What is the TP of this pipeline? What is the TP, sir? Tarun, Varun, or, or Tanushri, or first Manasa, Lokesh. What is TP? TP is the maximum segment delay, right? Yes, maximum segment delay is equal to 8x here. Yes, pipeline time is equal to 8x, max stage delay 8x. Clear? If the longest pipeline stage is split into two pipeline stages of the equal latency, the new frequency is dash gigahertz, ignoring the delays of the pipeline registers. So, there are no intermediate registers given. So, we need to ignore them. So, we have one more um, oh, pipeline, pipeline 2. In the pipeline 2, maximum stage has, has actually been divided into two equal stages. That is, S1 will remain the same as 6x. S2 is of the maximum stage delay, will get divided into two equal stages of the latencies. 4x, 4x and S3 is equal to 3x. Am I clear? Here what is the TP? TP if I am not wrong is equal to 6x. Are we clear? In the first pipeline, pipeline time is equal to 8x. In the second pipeline, pipeline time is equal to 6x because the maximum stage latency is the pipeline time. This is what you need to remember all the time. Okay. So here the thing is, um, we, we are asked about uh, frequency, right? So here, this frequency is 3 gigahertz. We need to find out the frequency of the second processor. Simple. If 8x is equal to 3 gigahertz, 2x is equal to what? So, what is the relationship between time and the frequency? If 1 by 8x is equal to 3 gigahertz, 1 by 6x is equal to how much? Is equal to 4 gigahertz applying the cross multiplication rule. Are we clear? Are we clear? So, even when you cross multiply, you'll get what, um, you know, the frequency of the second pipeline time. Okay. Tanishri, Varun, or, or Manasa, or Lokesh. Are we clear about this all? 
yeah due to the time restrictions we were not able to you know cover as many as i wanted but still i hope you people would do a lot better than what we discussed here i hope you people everyone who is following the session or without following the session are going to achieve the best rank and i'm, I'm sure that you're going to get it but before we leave i want you people to attend tomorrow session even which is a very important session for operating system because i'm tomorrow i'm just going to emphasize on on you know process synchronization because most of the people they requested me to take a session on synchronization but it's a marathon session uh, right at 10 we'll start let it take as many hours as as needed but but most um, you know preference will will be given to the synchronization topic tomorrow okay are we clear can we leave i hope you enjoyed the session rather than enjoying the session i want you people to understand to the level i desire you people to understand so that you people will do a lot better in your exams first of all before you attend the exam first of all understand that you people need to read the question most of the people you will drop your shoulders the moment you come across a lengthy question clear to revise and see why other than this i'll see i will see because the, since day after tomorrow is the only um, the gate exam i don't know if there is a possibility but i will discuss if you still need more sessions please let me know now itself i will talk to the people what top tomorrow session will be operating systems i'm starting at 10 o'clock okay will be intimated soon uh, about this tomorrow session i'm starting at 10 o'clock i will see if one more session on co is possible or not but do you want one more session tomorrow and see why please let me know you can comment it if you do have any i mean any specific topics also you can comment it i'll i'll see what i can do um and and that's it but more importantly i want you people to read the question completely even when you get a complete uh, you know lengthy question you do not drop your shoulders you not get scared i want you people to read the question lengthy question is not necessary to be complex lengthy question is lengthy just because of the details that are given into that just you need to go through the question you need to segregate the details collect the details then it will be made simple otherwise backtrack extract the question from right then backtrack to the details you will be able to solve the question yep important topic is what no no tomorrow is operating systems but which topic on cvo you want again for one more uh, time which topic in cvo again you want tomorrow at 10 o'clock we have a youtube session operating system that is confirmed but cvo based on the request that i get i will plan it maybe sometime in the afternoon but it depends purely depend on you people if you come up with a request i'll be able to do something also you need to specify um you know the topic also please provide me the topic what topic you want specifically because we do have a very less time we cannot you know stretch the topics which topic you want tomorrow most emphasis will given will be given on the topic synchronization in operating system are we clear so come up come up with a topic i will will definitely do uh, what i can I, i will i will do my best um to make you people prepare for the day after tomorrow's exam so with which i need to finish it off because one more session is going to start right now for me i mean in some other platform gancher tomorrow lokesh tomorrow gancher in in operating system definitely i'll i'll explain what exactly is gancher is not a big big deal varun okay i'll see okay sure i will come up with a plan but meanwhile i request the other people also to you know how you people will be able to communicate with me just you know use this message box okay in this message box even after this i want you people to post your queries or the topics that you want tomorrow in cvo that's it from the session thank you so much and good night